Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Marvin Hemeyer case. Marvin Hemeyer is best known for conducting an attack in 2004 with an armored bulldozer, often referred to as the killdozer. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So this is an interesting story, the story of the killdozer. I started working on this outline some time ago. I pulled all the information that I was going to use and started building it out, but I put it on hold, thinking I would come back to it later when I could find more information. And then we see this documentary come to Netflix called Tread. This is the story of Marvin Hemeyer. So I watched the documentary, and it was actually pretty good, except for the special effects where they tried to make it look like the killdozer was still there. Of course, the actual killdozer that was used is now gone. It was destroyed. So I think this documentary really provided a lot of information that I did not have access to before, specifically the interviews with people with whom Marvin Hemeyer had disputes. So really an interesting documentary. So in this case, I'll be looking at the background, then move to the timeline of the crime, and then I'll talk about the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the background, Marvin Hemeyer was born in South Dakota on October 28, 1951. He served in the Air Force and was stationed in Colorado. Apparently, Marvin was an exceptional welder and mechanic. After he left the Air Force, he moved to Grand Lake, Colorado, 15 miles from the town of Granby. Colorado. Marvin bought two acres of land in Granby, Colorado in 1992 for $42,000 and operated a muffler shop on that property. Not long after this, some dispute occurred around his alleged refusal to sell that property to another business owner who wanted to build a concrete batch plant. Evidently, Marvin had agreed to sell it for one price, then he increased the price several times. There was a conflict between Marvin and the zoning commission that occurred after this. They approved construction of the concrete plant next to Marvin's property, land that Marvin was using but did not own. They demanded that Marvin connect his muffler shop on his property to public sewer. The cost to connect to city sewer was between seventy dollars and $80,000. Marvin eventually was fined for not complying and he initiated a lawsuit. With the concrete plant being built next to his property, he would need an easement to connect to the sewer. He was offered the easement in exchange for dropping his lawsuit, but he wouldn't let the lawsuit go. Marvin continued to operate the muffler shop for a while, but then closed his business and decided to auction off his property and his equipment, including a Komatsu D355A bulldozer that he had purchased in California in the summer of 2002. At the auction, he sold all the equipment except for the bulldozer, and he did not sell the building or the land. At the auction, he did not sell the land or the buildings on the land, but he did sell all the equipment except for that bulldozer. Eventually, another business owner bought the land and the buildings for $400,000, and he leased a metal building on the property back to Marvin. Marvin would use that to store his bulldozer. That building sat between the muffler shop and that concrete plant. The new owner hooked up the sewer shortly after he bought the business, making it seem as if Marvin was exaggerating how unfortunate and desperate his situation was before that. If the sewer hookup was that easy, why didn't Marvin just do that? Why did it become a lawsuit and a lot of other trouble? Now we find out later from two and a half hours of recordings that Marvin produced when he was sitting in a hot tub on the balcony in his house in Grand Lake, Colorado one day, he said that he determined that God wanted him to carry out an attack on people who had wronged him, using what Marvin referred to as an MK tank. So yet again we see more hot tub inspired violence. Marvin went to work on modifying the bulldozer into what would eventually become referred to as the killdozer. He worked on the project for over a year and a half, living in the metal building much of the time, he was amazed that several people who came into the building and saw the project didn't realize what he was doing. Marvin's modifications to the Komatsu bulldozer were extensive. He built an armored shell around the cab and around the engine compartment of the bulldozer. 
he took plates of half-inch steel and welded them together with a space in the middle that he filled with concrete. He placed cameras on the vehicle and protected them with bulletproof Lexon plastic. The cameras were connected to three monitors he had inside the vehicle. He had a compressed air tank inside the vehicle connected to nozzles directed at those plastic shields in front of the cameras so he could blow away any dust that would have obscured his view. He had five weapons inside the vehicle with him, two pistols, a 357 Magnum, and a Caltech P11 semi-automatic pistol, it's a 9mm, and three rifles, a Barrett M82 50 caliber rifle, a Ruger Mini-14, chambered in 5.56mm NATO, and an FN FNC, also chambered in 556 He had three gun ports in the armor, one for each of the rifles. The gun ports were pointed forward, rear, and to the right side. There was no gun port on the left side of the vehicle. The bulldozer was 49 tons when he started working on it, and it was 61 and a half tons after his modifications. Marvin carried out his attack on June 4, 2004. He was 52 years old at that time. He covered the outside of the vehicle with grease so that anyone who tried to climb up on it would have difficulty. He then lowered the armored shell onto the cab using a remote control connected to a crane, so he sealed himself in. He then drove through the building that the bulldozer was in. It wasn't going to fit through the door coming back out, although, of course, it fit going in. He proceeded to ram the bulldozer into the concrete plant, the town hall, a local newspaper office, the home of the former mayor, a hardware store, and a number of vehicles along the way. Several attempts were made to stop Marvin. People tried putting a steel rod into the tracks, ramming his vehicle with construction vehicles. The police and civilians fired bullets at the vehicle. A police officer dropped a flashbang down the exhaust pipe, but none of that actually stopped the vehicle. He returned fire at the police through the gun ports, but no one was injured. Marvin also fired at propane tanks and power transformers, but he didn't cause any significant damage to those. It appears as though he was trying to cause an explosion. Just before Marvin attacked the hardware store, the radiator of the bulldozer started to leak. He was also leaking hydraulic fluid. When Marvin was destroying the store, one of the tracks fell into the basement, immobilizing the bulldozer. Police officers reported hearing a single gunshot after the bulldozer came stuck. As it turns out, Marvin used the 357 Magnum to bring an end to his life. It would take the police until 2 a.m. the next day to gain entry into the bulldozer's cab. They had to use a cutting torch because explosives did not damage the armor. So Marvin really did design the armor in a way that was quite resistant to potential threats. Marvin Hemeyer was the only fatality of the attack. He would damage 13 buildings altogether and cause $7 million in damage. The town would eventually destroy the Komatsu bulldozer. They didn't want people taking parts of it as souvenirs. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. As is often the case, we see a tale of two stories in terms of how people viewed Marvin Hemeyer prior to the attack. On one side, we see people that liked him. He was described as being cheerful, polite, a wonderful person, a good guy. He actually had a reasonably large group of friends. He would regularly go snowmobiling with several of them. On the other hand, we see a story of somebody who liked arguing. For example, we see that Granby, Colorado wasn't the only place where Marvin caused trouble in public meetings. He was active in Grand Lake, Colorado over a measure to legalize gambling there. Apparently, he became verbally aggressive with someone who had a different opinion about that measure. Looking at both sides of the story, Marvin's opinions and the opinions of those around him, it looks like Marvin was antagonistic and paranoid. He was looking for a fight. Many have speculated that Marvin had paranoid personality disorder. I don't know if he did or he didn't. All we can really do is look at the different behaviors and see if they align with the features of this personality. In the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, we see that paranoid personality disorder has seven symptom criteria. Four or more are required for a diagnosis. Let's go through these symptom criteria. The first one, a person believes that others are deceiving, exploiting, or harming them, even though the evidence does not support that conclusion. This one seems to fit. He reported that after he lost against the zoning board, people were making fun of him in public, looking at him funny and laughing behind his back. I mean, they could have been, but this seems like 
an unusual reaction towards somebody who lost something like that. It wasn't like a big deal. So again, it just seems unusual. The next one, preoccupation with unjustified doubts about the loyalty of friends or colleagues. I don't really see any evidence for this one. Moving to symptom number three, reluctant to confide in others, fearful that the information will be used against him. He didn't confide in his girlfriend about what he was thinking, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was because he was fearful. So I would say no on this one. Next one, interprets benign remarks as demeaning or threatening. This is possible, but again, there's not a lot of clear evidence about this one. Moving to the fifth symptom criterion, persistently bears grudges. This one seems to match. The next symptom believes that their character or reputation is being attacked and quickly reacts with anger. Well, I don't know about this one because he did react with anger, but he did not react quickly. And then the last one, symptom number seven, believes that a spouse or partner is unfaithful without justification. I don't see any evidence to support this one. So here we only see an alignment with maybe two symptoms. So some paranoia, but not so much that we would think of this as a disordered personality. So let's take a look at his personality profile as conceptualized using the five-factor model. I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So with openness, I would say low to mid-range. He seemed like a fairly rigid thinker. Not necessarily somebody that appreciated art, although he was quite creative. So it's really hard to tell here. In terms of conscientiousness, the level was high. He was a hard worker. He was very successful. With extroversion, I would say low to mid, although we do see some evidence that he was friendly and polite, as I mentioned. With agreeableness, I think this one's pretty clearly low. He had low trust, low altruism. He was relatively straightforward, so that would point toward high agreeableness. But anybody that builds an armored killdozer and destroys buildings in a town would likely be considered low in agreeableness. With neuroticism, the level would be mid, maybe even high. He had anger and maybe some feelings of depression. Now, there's also a theory out there about delusions. Marvin believed that God was asking him or maybe commanding him to modify a bulldozer to tear apart a town. This does appear to be delusional. He also believed that the reason he was never married was so he could fulfill this mission. Marvin seemed to misinterpret information. He attributed normal occurrences to destiny. And this is something we see quite a bit with delusions. A few examples. He said, other than the building, the only item that didn't sell in the auction was that bulldozer. As if that was a sign, he should use the bulldozer in an attack. This makes me wonder, if the only item that didn't sell in the auction was a push mower, would he have used that in an attack? I guess kill mower just doesn't have the same ring as kill dozer. Although, Marvin wasn't the one who created that term, killdozer. He said that the bulldozer only fit in that metal building by one inch. He took that to mean he was supposed to modify the bulldozer and again use it in an attack. Seems like a stretch for just seeing a bulldozer that fits through a door. If someone was pleasantly surprised that a box of pasta fit on a shelf by just a small margin, would they plan a massive rigatoni attack? It almost seems like he wanted to get revenge but needed, at least in his mind, to justify the attack. At one point, he said that the people in the town picked on the wrong man. He formed himself into an anti-hero who was going to pick a fight with big government and bring suffering to all who wronged him. The only difficulty was that Granby, Colorado, was a town of about 1,500 people, an unlikely target for someone who is anti-government. And the people that he believed had harmed and insulted him, had not really done anything wrong. Sometimes delusions occur in people, and they behave a certain way consistent with those delusions. So the delusions drive the behavior. Other times, people have a strong desire to do something, and they form a belief system around that desire that looks like or eventually becomes a delusion. In a case like this, what could be happening is that there were feelings of depression and anger. And to make sense of these feelings, this narrative about revenge rises to the top. It makes everything okay, in a sense. Now the sadness and the desire for revenge can serve a purpose. I think this makes the most sense based on the fact that Marvin really did do something quite unusual here. 
he planned an attack for several years. Just the part where he worked on the bulldozer was longer than a year and a half. Most of the time, when somebody's angry, they lash out when they are still having that feeling of anger. Not a few days later or a few weeks later. Marvin held on to his grudge for years. This type of determination and commitment to a cause requires more than anger. It requires a belief system that makes the action rational or perhaps, in a case like this, necessary or heroic. Again, at least in his mind. So it may have been that Marvin did not have any mental illness, but rather distorted thinking which led him to believe that others were after him and inspired a need for revenge that consumed him. These feelings really became the purpose in his life. Marvin said in one of the recordings, sometimes a reasonable man must do unreasonable things. A more appropriate line would be sometimes an unreasonable man must make up reasons so he can do unreasonable things. The next question is, did Marvin intend to kill others? Some have said that Marvin didn't mean to kill anyone. And of course, he did not end up actually killing other people. He did shoot at four people, however, and when somebody is shooting another person, it makes sense to believe they were intending to kill that person. He also rammed buildings without knowing if people were in there. It's really hard to know what he was thinking, though. It does make sense that casualties were not his main focus. He was willing to kill people if they got in his way, but I don't think that was a central part of his plan necessarily. He had access to a number of rifles. They were in the cab with him. There were easier ways for him to kill people if he didn't like them. He didn't need to build this armored bulldozer to do that. I think it might have been more about making a statement, projecting himself as a hero. If he caused the death of another person who wasn't attacking him in some way, that would have hurt his cause. It would have been harder for people to view him as a hero. The last point I'll address here is the criticism of the police who failed to stop the bulldozer. This is something I've heard many times. This case really just highlights the advantage of someone who catches others unprepared. I think it's reasonable to believe that nobody in that town was expecting an armored bulldozer to attack that day. The police just weren't prepared for a situation like that. There were things that the police could have done to limit the danger potential of that bulldozer. One that comes to mind is they could have thrown paint on the cameras or used cans of spray paint to cover the cameras. Now, there's been this argument that says something like, wait a second, the dozer was too dangerous to get near. Well, I actually think it was too dangerous to get near, but in the documentary, we see that the police officers were walking right alongside the dozer for a while. If they were willing to take that type of chance anyway, they could have done something helpful. In addition to the paint idea, they could have dumped gasoline on the dozer and set it on fire. That would not have really damaged the vehicle itself, that steel armor, but it would have made it extremely hot inside the vehicle. So hot that Marvin could not have survived, even with the modified air conditioning system that he designed for that piece of equipment. I know they tried throwing a steel rod in the treads unsuccessfully, but normally that would be a good way to try to stop a treaded vehicle. So again, if somebody was going to take the chance to be that close anyway, that could have had a chance of working. Panic is not known as a catalyst for good ideas. So I really kind of understand what happened here. Again, they were just taken completely off guard. Marvin really did gain the element of surprise. So those are my thoughts on the Killdozer case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.